1935, Britain was at peace. But people remembered the last war and hoped it wouldn't happen again. But there was war in Asia. Just an item on the newsreels to most of us, though. It couldn't happen here. But in Europe, fascism was already on the march. 1936, the Nazis reoccupied the Rhineland, and war with Germany became quite the possibility. So Britain prepared fighter planes, balloon barrage, search lights, ACAC gun sights. Britain needed air raid precautions as well. A whole army of civil defense workers, ambulance crews, air raid wardens, first aid and rescue parties, everything ready for the battle that could happen here and probably would. We expected that this would be one of the enemy's main weapons, the one kilo incendiary bomb. We had over 1,000 fire brigades throughout the country. It was their job to fight peacetime fires. But if this little bomb were dropped in tens of thousands on our target, as it might well be, the regular brigades, efficient as they were, would not be able to deal with the fire. They had courage, training, equipment, but not the number. For war emergency purposes, the regular brigades had to be heavily reinforced by volunteers. In Whitehall, instructions were prepared and issued to local authorities. An appeal was launched throughout England, Scotland and Wales for volunteers to form an auxiliary fire service. And the national campaign was strengthened by local recruiting drives. We needed women too, as in the other defence services. And the first recruits were sent out with the job of bringing in more volunteers to swell the ranks of the new auxiliary fire service. I volunteered in those early days. We held parades, gave displays to make ourselves known. And in London, they put us in the Lord Mayor's show, alongside the fighting services. It wasn't all parades, though. New recruits like me had to be trained. We weren't paid, mind you, and we had to do it in our spare time. But we came along in the evenings or at weekends from offices, shops, factories to learn the job. Pump operation, the handling of branches and jets. The regulars taught us the tricks of the trade. classroom instruction and practical exercises to get to know our equipment. Hook ladder drill too. It was tough, but we needed it to make us fit. The training given to recruits at the headquarters of the London Fire Brigade was typical of the work that went on all over the country during 1938 and 1939 with ever-increasing urgency. Women were particularly trained for watch room and control room duty, thereby releasing able-bodied men for firefighting. Trained and ready if need be, the auxiliary fire service parade. While they waited, they took every opportunity of attending fire calls with the regular brigade. It was valuable experience for them.
But to fight fires, you need equipment as well as men. And the government ordered the mass production of standardized appliances, chief among them the trailer pump and the self-propelled heavy unit, a utility model of the traditional red fire engine. Miles more hose was needed too, more than Britain could supply. The gap was filled by imports from Canada and the United States. Meanwhile, Nazi Germany was preparing to march again. Hitler had taken Czechoslovakia. August 1939, the Danzig question. Tension grew. War could happen. It was going to happen. On September 1st, Germany invaded Poland. That same day, the standby telegram went out. The AFS was mobilized. That night, like thousands of others, I left my city job and became a fireman for the duration. And the next two days, well, the only word is hectic. The plan went into operation. Schools and garages one day were emergency fire stations the next. And we'd earmark transport for the AFS, too. <laughs> Funny to see taxis, private cars, even tradesmen's vans towing those trailer pumps of ours. On rivers and waterways, emergency fireboats were got ready. Canal barges were adapted for service on inland water. Many different craft were fitted with pumps, ready to protect vital warehouses and ships in dock areas. After the months of careful preparation, mobilization went forward quickly and efficiently. On September 3rd, 1939, the ultimatum to Germany expired and the nation heard Mr. Chamberlain say, I have to tell you now that no such undertaking has been received and that consequently this country is at war with Germany. You remember that first winter of the war? Nothing happened. They called it the phony war. We went on training hard. The war wouldn't be phony forever. The women settled down to their new jobs, or did the same old jobs in new surroundings. For us firemen, there was servicing, maintenance, cleaning, and spit and polish, a lot of that too. We auxiliaries wanted to be as smart as the regulars, and I think we were too. And particularly smart on the day His Majesty inspected us at the headquarters of the London Fire Brigade. It was a long, cold winter, and still nothing happened. Sometimes we could warm ourselves at a fire, though. Regulars and auxiliaries would turn out together, and we new chaps, well, we learned a lot from it. But it still wasn't the job we'd joined up to do. Suddenly, in the spring, it happened. <laughs> happened very quickly. The German breakthrough on the Western Front. As a footnote to history, we record that the London fireboat, Cassie Shaw, was one of the little ships that helped to bring our army back from the beaches. Now, Britain stood alone. After the months of waiting, now was the time. Now the war was to be in the British sky and on British soil. The heroic few of fighter command again and again broke up the mass attacks of the Luftwaffe, but some reached their target. They struck first at the precious oil supplies, the Pembroke Dock oil storage. It gave the wartime fire service its first real test. The burning oil containers gave off billowing clouds of acrid smoke. The spectacle was tremendous and terrifying. Firemen from all over South Wales, from Birmingham, Gloucester and Bristol, attempted to deal with the blaze. But it was more than a blaze, or a fire, it was a conflagration.
Immense quantities of water were pumped from the sea to make foam. For 16 days and nights, over 300 men from 20 brigades continued the fight, though more than once the planes came back and bombed them again, killing some firemen, wounding others. In the end, the firemen beat the fire and succeeded in saving 10 out of the 17 tanks. The enemy is struck again at Thameshaven on the Essex shore of London's river. The blazing oil lit up the night sky for miles around. Brigades from the whole of Essex and London were reinforced from as far afield as Derby and Nottingham. Fires burned for 14 days and nights. They left behind a wilderness of battered and mangled containers. The enemy had struck hard. Soon the Germans changed their policy and their target. The bombers were switched from isolated military targets to concentrate on London. September 7, 1940, the first fires were started in the congested dock areas. The Luftwaffe, driven from the daytime skies by the RAF, came back that night and every night. Were you in London when those night raids were on? I'll never forget that time. First, it was the docks. Then they stopped being so cutesy. I've never seen anything like it. And work. Sometimes we went for nights on end without sleep. And not long before, we'd been complaining because there was nothing to do. London's burning, London's burning. It was just a kid's song in the old days. And we were there to stop it burning down. Not just the firemen of London, but fellows called in from Manchester, Birmingham, and all dozens of other places. One night in November, we heard the planes as usual, but they didn't come to us. The attack was switched again, and the enemy began a series of concentrated attacks on provincial centers of war industry and shipping. Through the winter of 1940-41, the raids went on. HE bombs, parachute mines, oil bombs, and always incendiary bombs. The immediate damage was great, and behind them, the raiders left vast areas of spreading fire. No fire service in the world had ever yet had to handle anything like this. The firemen needed all their training, and all their courage too. In the control rooms, the women auxiliaries strove to meet the demands for reinforcements, reliefs, by calling on brigades from cities, towns and villages that were not being attacked on that particular night. Morning after morning, the reliefs came in to towns that looked like this, to help deal with the fires that were still burning and to wait for the same again at dusk.
London didn't have much of a rest. December the 29th it was, Saturday night of all nights. And they went for the city. They didn't burn St Paul's, but it wasn't for want of trying. The damage done that night was so extensive and so rapid that the government made compulsory fire watching general. The employees of every factory, office and shop and the residents of every street in target areas were enrolled in the fire guard. They were the new first line of defense against the incendiary bomb. Spring 1941, spring at last. No slackening in the rain. Some of the worst came in April and May and the fire watchers proved their value. Six months of blitz, six months of fire raising. Fire was the enemy's biggest weapon. The firefighters were among our chief defenders. They were the frontline soldiers of those days. The firemen's courage and endurance were beyond all praise. But courage and endurance were not enough. Listen to what the Home Secretary, Mr. Herbert Morrison, said in May 1941. The real weakness of our present arrangements is the many small units of administration. Even quite small operations may involve 20 or 30 separate local authorities and chiefs of fire brigades. The remedy is the transfer to the state of the administration and control of the fire fighting services. So Parliament placed on the statute book an act to provide for the reorganization and improvement of the fire services of Great Britain. All the fire brigades of England, Scotland and Wales were now merged into the new single organization. Regulars and auxiliaries, men and women, paid and unpaid alike, became members of this body. At a special ceremony in London, the counterpart of many other ceremonies elsewhere, the LCC handed over to the Home Secretary the brigade that had stood up to the Blitz. Mr. Morrison came in person to accept the responsibility for the future management of the service. It was the youngest service of the Crown, but it had behind it the fine traditions of the local brigade and it had resources in men and equipment which individually those brigades could never command. The great administrative change were the flag for the new service and the badge modeled on the badge made famous by the AFS. A unified chain of command was set up. In each of the civil defense regions in England and Wales, the regional commissioner took charge of the firefighting resources. A chief regional fire officer was appointed to his staff. The local brigades were reorganized into fire forces. At each level, officers with appropriate staffs took command. Fire force commanders and their assistants, divisional officers and column officers, senior company and company officers. Women officers took their place beside them. Area officers and their assistants, group officers and assistant group officers. A new system of control was established radiating from the Home Office Fire Control Room, which was part of the great Home Security War Room in London. By this centralized control, the firefighting resources of the country could be concentrated in one spot or deployed to the best advantage over areas that were being simultaneously attacked. The movement of a disc or tally on the map meant action many miles away as a convoy set out to help a hard-pressed area. The young service required all-round improvements in technical standards. The Home Office and the Scottish Office issued instructions and advice, keeping all firemen informed of the latest developments in enemy tactics and in the technique of wartime firefighting. As part of a long-term policy, work was started on a comprehensive manual of firemanship. A standard drill book was issued immediately to ensure that all units were trained on the same line. Teams from the departmental inspectorates traveled the country 
to raise the standard of efficiency. A big innovation was a college for officers at Saltdean near Brighton. It was the first time that any uniformed service had set up a co-educational establishment. I was one of the instructors there. We had an urgent job on, to train men to be first-class officers. And under our first commandant, we tackled the job with enthusiasm. Potential officers were treated as officers. Each one had his own private room. There was a very good bar and common room to spend your evenings in. And for study or relaxation, there was the quiet atmosphere of the library. We had courses for women as well as men, and the college vestibule was a busy place as students hurried to their classes. In the laboratory, we taught them the chemistry of fire. We had a magnificent model town to teach the tactics of firefighting, all sorts of different situations and how you'd go about them. There were classroom discussions on the practical problems that might confront officers on the fire ground. And we had detailed scale models too of particular buildings to illustrate fire protection as well as fire extinction, like this model cinema. We gave instruction in the use of breathing apparatus, hard work that, and all the equipment they and their men would have to use. And when the weather was hot, we varied the routine a bit. On the women's side, their officers were taught all the jobs that fire women would have to do under their supervision, especially mobilizing and control room work. The women officers had to learn, too, things like leadership, discipline, and welfare. The college set out to establish a high standard for officers in the service. And that is what it did. But the training of the firemen themselves was equally important. The new fire forces set up residential training schools. Parade ground smartness was essential for discipline in action. Refresher courses were held for serving farmers. New recruits were given basic training. Skilled drivers were trained. Dispatch riders too. Including women. Women drivers were used extensively. One of their most useful jobs was ferrying vehicles from the central depots to the fire forces. Many areas had training schools for women only. There were fitness training courses, very valuable to women who had to spend much of their time in the cramped surroundings of a control room. In country areas, the NFS took the training to the farmen. The systematic training of part-time farmen had been a problem, but the service found the solution. The travelling van with the expert instructor who could go around teaching different stations at weekends or in the evenings. Small rural stations were just as much part of the NFS as the large town brigades, and they had just the same keenness. When a fire call came, they would leave their homes or their work with all possible speed and by any available means. Many extremely efficient works brigades were affiliated to the NFS. And meanwhile, behind the scenes, the administrative machine got into its stride.
emergency water supplies was tackled urgently. Every possible source of water was surveyed, scheduled, and got ready for use. Access points to canals and lakes were prepared. The basements of bombed houses converted. EWS basins were installed in very large numbers throughout the streets. Steel tanks, concrete basins, and brick basins were built wherever there was space. Elsewhere, the service improvised or had a natural supply piped to a basin. The laying of overground piping was part of the same program. Farmen laid over a thousand miles of it. We had pumping stations set up to supply the emergency water system. On tidal rivers, they were erected on bridges to ensure a supply of water, whatever the state of the tide. But emergency pipes could not be laid everywhere. The hose laying lorry was the answer when there was a sudden call for a water relay to a large fire. The lorry paid out hose as it went and could provide twin lines for half a mile. If necessary, more than one lorry could be used. For the countryside, where water might be scarce, the mobile dam unit was put into service. A fire engine carrying its own water supply. There were other appliances as well, the escape carrying unit and the 60-foot hand-operated turntable ladder. This ladder was designed to meet the shortage of mechanically operated 100-foot ladders. New vehicles included canteen vans and mobile kitchens, many of them given by the people of Canada. The control van served as a mobile control point during operation. The wireless car, too. The mobile stores van supplied outlying stations with uniforms. The mobile workshop gave service on the spot to pumps and vehicles which needed running repairs. The mobile workshop, though, was only the outpost for the NFS major repair organization. Many men were employed on heavy repair work, testing and repairing all types of vehicles. Appliances were cleaned and resprayed for service. As the NFS expanded, new fire stations were built to replace the ones improvised in the early days of the war. Many farmen, some had been builders in civil life, worked on the sites and, indeed, built their own station. So, the National Fire Service was organized. Before the war, the peacetime brigades were no more than 22,500 strong, 16,000 of them part-time men. By the outbreak of war, AFS volunteers had raised the figure to 210,000, a tenfold increase. Over 120,000 of them were part-timers. There were 13,000 women auxiliaries besides. The service which faced the Blitz of 1940-41 was only a little larger, but with the lessons of that winter in mind, the government decided that more men and women must be directed into the new National Fire Service. The NFS was at its strongest in 1942 and 1943, when it had 108,000 whole time and 186,000 part-time men, a total of 294,000. In addition, there were 32,000 whole-time and 52,000 part-time women, making 84,000 women in the service. The overall strength of the NFS in Great Britain at this time exceeded 350,000. Well, we settled down under the new management. Luckily, there was no repeat performance of the Blitz, 
but there were still some fires to keep us busy. All kinds of special jobs, too. For instance, we used to stand by while ships loaded and unloaded dangerous cargoes like munitions. We had to see that they took all the right safety precautions and watch out for the first sign of fire. Otherwise, there might have been a very nasty mess. It wasn't only the loading and unloading, though. Some of the chaps had a dangerous time fighting fires on board ships, sometimes at sea, sometimes in estuaries and docks, where one burnt-out ship might have held up the whole working of the port. And there were ordinary fires, too. Low-period fires, we call them. We were very strong on having as little damage as possible done by either fire or water. And we had special salvage squads to cover up and protect anything that might have got damaged. In the countryside, the NFS helped the farmer, bringing water to thirsty cattle, spraying the crops with insecticide. There were other kinds of special service jobs, too. A sunken drifter might be blocking the harbour fairway. They sent for the NFS. A battery of trailer pumps would do the trick. The enemy did not resume fire-raising attacks in force. But Britain did not go unscathed. In 1942, the Germans launched a series of vicious attacks against some of our most ancient cities, the so-called Baedeker Raid. Exeter, Bath, Norwich, York, Canterbury, all towns whose local resources were not large. The mobilization of pumps and equipment tested the flexibility of the NFS organization. 175 pumps were mobilized for the raid on Bath, and over 250 for Exeter. Other appliances, water units, hose laying lorries, field telephone vans, canteens, and mobile kitchens went with them. The stricken towns had the whole resources of the national organization to draw on. The Baedeker raids proved that the NFS set up work. The raids weren't big enough, though, to keep all of us busy. But we certainly weren't idle. Toys, for instance, they were very scarce during the war. Toy factories were making munitions for the soldiers. So fire stations made toys for the children. Some of the lads went in for art. A lot of firemen drew and painted pictures, of the Great Blitz, mostly. They had an exhibition here, and then in Canada and the States. But I can talk better than paint. Discussion groups were more in my line. We made munitions, too. Some of the profits went towards improving things about the station, and some to the NFS Benevolent Fund. the NFS in these years, but the invasion of Europe was coming shortly, and Britain was the main base. Filled with everything that was inflammable, a powder magazine. Fire was a threat to our success. The NFS fought places started not by Hitler, but by carelessness. War supplies were lost needlessly. The thing was serious, and the Fire Officers Committee launched a big propaganda campaign. D-Day came closer. The NFS stood by at the munitions factories, which were turning it out for 24 hours a day. And with the RAF, they learned the layout of vast ammunition dumps. At Bomber Command aerodromes, planes were going out daily to attack German war production centers. The NFS worked in close cooperation with the RAF, sometimes actually quartered on the drone and sharing the standby duties. The NFS worked too with the American Air Forces over here. The plan was figured out. And when an aircraft was in difficulties, the plan went into action. The carbon dioxide appliance moved off. The American firefighting section. The British firemen.
Aircraft of the crash usually burn. Time after time, the firemen were called to fires like this. To save the crew if they could. Anyway, to deal with the fire. A dangerous job when there's ammunition and bombs on board. And this is what it looked like after the night's work. Four. The NFS was assigned its part in the plan for the coming invasion. The fire defences of the south of England were to be strengthened to safeguard the army's lines of communication and supply against the expected enemy retaliation. The Home Office fire staff worked out the plans for what was known as the colour scheme. They made a survey of NFS equipment and personnel in England and Wales. The North Country, the Midlands and Wales, the brown areas, were called on to give up part of their strength. In these areas, the depleted service was reorganised. The extra men and extra pumps were sent to the blue areas, the east and south coast. Here was deployed a concentration of fire services greater than ever before. So the NFS prepared for its part in D-Day. Convoys of pumps moved south. Thousands of men and women moved south, ready for the biggest single operation of the war. The NFS were reinforced by the Corps of Canadian Firefighters, a fine body of men all of whom had volunteered for service here. We foresaw that firemen might be needed to go over to Europe. So, specially selected volunteers from England, Scotland and Wales were formed into five overseas colonies. The men trained under active service conditions. They learned the soldiers' art of camouflage and concealment. They toughened themselves up. They would be non-combatants, but ready to deal with casualties. The men were given a special kit, with a berry instead of the familiar peak cap. Miss Ellen Wilkinson inspected them while they were under training. Later, ready for service, one of the columns paraded in Hyde Park. We foresaw, too, a possible need for fireboats in the invasion port. Two flotillas were formed with parent ships on the Thames. The NFS was ready for D-Day. June 6, 1944, the British and American armies landed on the Normandy beaches. It was wonderful news. But we had expected the enemy to retaliate and he did. Hitler's secret weapon, this. It was a new emergency, and it meant a new job for the NFS. Fireman spotters in observation posts watched for the fall of the flying bombs. They phoned control center, and the civil defense rescue squads rushed to the scene of the incident. Yes, in the civil defense jargon, they call them incidents. More and more V1. The Air Force and the gunners shot them down. but some still got through. The civil defense services were superb, and the NFS played its part. Dealing with fires, that was their first task, but fires were only a small part of the damage. The main job was rescue, and the firemen helped the overworked rescue services.
turntable ladder could be used to reach and lower a casualty from an upper floor. Firemen cleared roads for traffic. Tidied up blitzed hospitals. Salvaged household goods. Helps to evacuate women and children from the danger zones. The main fly bomb attack lasted four months. Then the Allied armies pushing into Europe overran the launching sites and supply dumps and the attack was practically ended. But that wasn't all. After the V1, the V2 fired from the Reich itself. Throughout the winter of 1944, London was under fire once again. During this grim attack, number four overseas column was ordered to Europe to operate with the American 12th Army Group. The deputy chief of the fire staff saw them off at Tilbury, the first contingent of firemen ever to be sent to a foreign battleground. Meanwhile, London's ordeal from rockets continued and so did the work of the firemen. March 1945, we crossed the Rhine. We captured the rocket sites. The war was nearly over. We can now safely reduce the wartime strength of the NFS. Part-time firemen and firewomen in many parts of the country could be stood down. At a special parade in Hyde Park, Mr. Morrison voiced the country's appreciation of the work done by the part-time personnel. The women of the NFS had done a magnificent job. A gracious tribute was paid to them when Her Majesty the Queen, with Princess Elizabeth, came to Lambeth to review fire women from all over the country. The Queen took the salute at the march past. The overseas column returned from Europe. The commander of the American forces they were with had paid tribute to their splendid work. Sir Donald Somerville, then Home Secretary, welcomed them home at a special ceremony in Regent's Park. June 1945, Hyde Park, the big stand-down parade, the King and Queen reviewing the civil defence workers. I was there on parade with the others and proud of it too. Looking back over those six years, we'd done our bit for victory. The women marched ahead of us. We followed. Men from all the fire forces from the east to Land's End, all marching proudly past. And after us, the pumps and trailers, very spick and span. They hadn't always been so clean. Not at some of the fires I remember. The war was over. Hundreds of surplus trailer pumps were sent away for dispersal. The static water basins were removed. Steel piping went back into store. In stations up and down the land, men shook hands and went back to civil life. Wartime stations closed down. But the peacetime job of the fire service goes on. National Fire Service? Yes? What address? 21 Parkway. That's opposite the school, isn't it? Don't worry. They'll be on their way in a moment. 21 Parkway, opposite the school. 21 Parkway, opposite the school, right. 21 Parkway, opposite the school. 